Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Dr. Brad Roberts, the director of the Center for Global Security Research at Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to today's session on China's nuclear modernization and its implications, and to welcome Tong Zhao back to CGSR in the laboratory. Uh, let me make a few remarks to set the framework before introducing our speaker. Uh, in March of this year, Chinese President uh, Xi Jinping gave a speech about the, the next uh, five-year plan in which he spoke about his commitment to strengthen strategic forces and to, quote, accelerate the creation of high-level strategic deterrence. Subsequent reports in the eight months since uh, have um, given a lot of content to this uh, at the time obscure statement about accelerating the creation of high level strategic deterrence. We've had the reports of the ongoing construction of hundreds of new ICBM silos, reports of the accelerated growth of the I mobile ICBM force, reports of the deployments of MIRVED DF-41 long range new generation missiles, uh, reports of new novel nuclear delivery systems of the kind that President Vladimir Putin announced in 2018 for Russia. Uh, we've had the last week's report of the test of a fractional orbital bombardment system. And all of these reports come on top of predictions of changes to the overall size of China's nuclear stockpile which is projected to, quote, more than double by 2030. Predictions of changes to China's nuclear doctrine, such as a move to launch on warning for some part of the force, uh, and um, predictions of changes to the operational readiness of the force to enable it to execute that launch on warning doctrine. This is a lot of change uh, at, at, at a very rapid pace. Uh, and it raises a series of questions for us, all of us. Why? Why now? What changed in uh, what changed in China's traditional calculus of lean and effective forces for nuclear deterrence? Today, how how does it, or more to the point, how does President Xi answer the question? How much is enough? Uh, and of course, we have in the West have attached various labels to this um, um, question of enough. Is China sprinting to parity? Does it even seek parity with the United States? Uh, we've talked about China's strategic breakout. Does it think it's breaking out and towards what end? We've talked about China as a nuclear near peer does China think about nuclear near peer? Uh, and uh, what does President Xi mean when he talks about ha China having a military posture consistent with China's future place at the center of the world stage? Uh, these are big questions. Uh, and and uh, they require not just understanding, but a strategy from the United States to respond that is effective in preserving deterrence and assurance of allies and strategic stability while at the same time helping to avoid the outcome that neither side wants or seeks, which is a costly and dangerous arms race with new forms of crisis instability. So uh, we've made a priority at CGSR of trying to understand these new questions and some of their new answers. And uh, we're, we're very pleased that uh, Dr. Tong Zhao has accepted an invitation to speak with us today. Uh, he is well known to us at CGSR as one of China's most knowledgeable and thoughtful experts on these questions. He last joined us about 18 months ago for the workshop we convened on uh, US, Russia, China, nuclear risk reduction in an era of major power rivalry. 
Uh, Dr. Zhao is a senior fellow in the nuclear policy program at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. He's based in the endowment's office in Beijing. Uh, he conducts research on strategic security issues, including nuclear weapons policy, deterrence, arms control, non-proliferation, missile defense, and China's security and foreign policy. Uh, he, he recently served as a virtual visiting fellow at Sandia National Laboratory's Cooperative Monitoring Center. He holds a number of positions as editor and board member of various professional organizations in our field. He, he was previously a Stanton Nuclear Security Fellow at Harvard University and a non-resident fellow at Pacific Forum in Honolulu. Dr. Zhao holds a PhD in science, technology, and international affairs from the Georgia Institute of Technology, as well as an MA in international relations and a BS in physics from Tsinghua University. Tong, thanks so much for making the time to join us today. Thank you for your leadership on these issues. We look forward to your opening remarks. And let me remind the group, uh, our speaker will go for approximately 45 minutes. At that point, I'd like to turn to raised electronic hands and bring voices into the discussion. If you'd rather submit a question to the chat function, I'm, I'm happy to get that into play as circumstances permit. Um, Tong, thanks so much. Over to you. Thank you so much, Brad. It's a great pleasure uh, to be here. Um, I think I will discuss uh, a few things today. One is to briefly go uh, through uh, China's nuclear modernization. Uh, there is already uh, a lot of uh, public available information, so I wouldn't uh, delve too deeply into the first part. And then I will discuss potential drivers of Chinese nuclear buildup. And I will then also discuss the domestic uh, policy environment uh, against which this nuclear uh, buildup is taking place. And last, uh, I will discuss um, how does this mean for potential arms control cooperation with China, uh, whether arms control can be useful in uh, addressing uh, the nuclear risks. Um, so, firstly, about uh, China's nuclear modernization, very briefly, um, uh, since a few years ago, Chinese government uh, started to openly advocate for China's nuclear triad capability. That's an important departure uh, from China's traditional policy because China used to criticize uh, the U.S. and Russia for developing and maintaining nuclear triad. Uh, but now it itself is publicly uh, developing this capability. Um, it, its land forces uh, include uh, DF-41, the most uh, advanced Chinese uh, ICBM. Um, and the newly uh, revealed construction of uh, more than I think 250 silos in northwestern China is also an important development. For many decades, uh, China maintained about 20 uh, ICBM silos or silo-based ICBMs, but suddenly it is uh, building uh, hundreds of them. Um, the, uh, but China is also uh, developing and modernizing uh, other types of land-based forces, the DF-41 is also uh, put onto uh, launch vehicles. Uh, so, um, so it is um, uh, diversifying its uh, land-based uh, forces. And in terms of the sea-based capabilities, um, apparently China is uh, working on its 094 class uh, SSBN. Uh, the fact that the SSBN boat is uh, not uh, very silent, according to a uh, public report, but China is still uh, building uh, six of them. Um, 
I think that indicates uh, it's slightly changing its traditional approach, which is to uh, uh, build a small number of uh, new platform and to test it and to improve it quickly and then uh, moving on to the next generation um, before really uh, uh, producing a large number of them. Uh, but uh, the, DF, the, the 094 is uh, not very, I think, satisfactory from the technological perspective of China is still deploying uh, six of them. Um, so that shows China starts to uh, emphasize the importance of quantity in addition to uh, quality of its uh, nuclear forces. And uh, President Xi Jinping, when he inspected China's, uh, uh, one of Chinese naval bases uh, a few years ago, uh, said, uh, the Chinese nuclear submarine uh, force needs to develop uh, big. Uh, uh, so that uh, certainly uh, will further incentivize uh, the sea-based capability uh, development. And in terms of the air-based capability, uh, in addition to its current uh, H-6 bomber, China is also introducing uh, a new long-range a uh, stealthy uh, strategic bomber that is likely to be nuclear capable. Uh, it is uncertain whether China's uh, air-launched cruise missile is nuclear capable, but uh, it looks like China is introducing a potentially nuclear capable air-launched ballistic missile uh, in the future. So in addition to the development of nuclear triad, uh, China is uh, putting uh, more nuclear warheads onto missiles uh, through the MIRVING technology. Uh, the fact that China uh, may be deploying MIRV silo-based ICBMs in addition to its development of an early warning uh, capability makes people wonder if China is potentially shifting towards launch on warning or launch under attack posture. Um, I think uh, launch under attack uh, may, be more, uh, may be more likely uh, to be the Chinese uh, thinking compared with uh, launch on warning. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, and China can use this early warning data to uh, uh, better uh, prepare and mobilize these nuclear forces in a crisis <clears throat> to increase their uh, survivability and wait uh, until confirmation of nuclear detonation before conducting a nuclear retaliation. It is uncertain whether uh, China will make this posture shift. Uh, there is uh, evidence of growing interest uh, within the military uh, and some um, recently retired uh, a senior military officer from the PLA rocket force uh, said publicly that China has already acquired um, launch under attack or launch on warning capability. Um, in addition to uh, uh, strategic nuclear forces or intercontinental range nuclear forces, China is uh, investing uh, significantly into theater range nuclear forces, the DF-21 and DF-26. Um, so it looks like China is um, uh, thinking about theater range uh, uh, nuclear scenarios in addition to uh, building up its capacity to conduct a second strike against US homeland. Uh, and of course, uh, another uh, development that is often discussed is uh, the increasing entanglement between nuclear and non-nuclear systems. The uh, conventional nuclear dual-capable DF-26 missile is uh, an important example, and uh, it could introduce risks of misunderstanding during a crisis, uh, whether uh, China's own dual-capable missiles were attacked by a conventional strike or uh, China is uh, mobilizing and uh, launching its own dual-capable missiles 
uh, in both scenarios, it could can, uh, introduce uh, misunderstanding and confusion and therefore raise the risk of inadvertent escalation. But there is uh, no evidence that China itself uh, has developed uh, full appreciation of such risks. And um, it looks like uh, the lack of understanding of the escalation risk may be one important reason that China is massively deploying uh, such dual capable missile systems. And China is working on some new de delivery, uh, nuclear delivery technologies. Uh, its boost glider program uh, has drawn a lot of attention. Uh, the DF-27 is reportedly a conventional system, but it could be nuclear capable according to American uh, government sources. Um, and apparently China is also reportedly developing intercontinental range uh, boost glider system. The recently reported testing of an orbital hypersonic system using FOBs um, uh, could be an indicator that uh, China is working on intercontinental range uh, gliders. But, uh, you know, FOBs could just be a testing bed uh, to ensure that uh, China would be able to launch and uh, retrieve its glider uh, on its own territory. Uh, so it doesn't mean uh, China will necessarily uh, deploy a glider on the FOBs uh, in, 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 in the future. Um, and there is also reports that China may be experimenting with some of the uh, also very exotic uh, nuclear delivery system that, that, tri that Russia has been uh, developing, um, such as nuclear powered uh, cruise missile, but there is very little uh, publicly available information on that. So now I will uh, discuss potential drivers uh, behind China's nuclear uh, buildup. Um, of course, uh, there is a lot of discussion about uh, how uh, Chinese concerns about American uh, missile defense uh, is uh, driving China's nuclear modernization. Um, and um, in this regard, China's concern is really about uh, uh, the scenario in which China has to firstly absorb a, a comprehensive disarming first strike from the United States. And then uh, maybe only a very small number of Chinese nuclear weapons uh, will survive. And uh, China has to make sure uh, American uh, homeland missile defense wouldn't be able to uh, intercept this very small number of survived Chinese nuclear forces. So because of this uh, scenario, uh, in theory, even a modest um, sized American homeland missile defense system uh, could uh, potentially uh, threaten Chinese second strike capability. Um, and, but still I think um, missile defense uh, uh, cannot fully explain uh, about the uh, relatively abrupt uh, Chinese nuclear buildup. The U.S. missile defense capability has been developing mostly uh, incrementally uh, in recent years, whereas um, the Chinese uh, nuclear buildup uh, in recent years appears to be rather abrupt. Uh, if you uh, consider the construction of uh, silos, et cetera, especially the silos. Um, the, the fact that China may be uh, building uh, three uh, silo uh, sites simultaneously, and especially if you think China is uh, using the so-called shell game uh, to uh, deploy uh, only a small number of real missiles in a large number of silos, uh, then it appears that uh, the Chinese concern behind the silo construction is not about U.S. missile defense. It is more about American preemptive uh, nuclear first strike, uh, because that's you know what silos are uh, best uh, uh, useful for. Uh, so it looks like the silos indicates China is also worried about, uh, or China also has a greater concern about U.S. preemptive strike. And why is that? Um, I think I will discuss that later. Uh, but in addition to missile defense, uh, 
Chinese experts also worry a range of other uh, technologies could undermine China's nuclear deterrent, uh, conventional precision strike weapons, for example, could be particularly threatening to China's road mobile uh, ICBMs. Uh, Space-based sensors can better uh, detect and track Chinese uh, nuclear forces. Uh, cyber weapons can be, in theory, used to interfere with China's nuclear command control system. AI technology can be used to better detect and track uh, Chinese nuclear forces. Uh, unmanned uh, systems, again, uh, is another uh, new uh, platform for collecting information and maybe even threatening uh, Chinese nuclear forces. So in theory, all these uh, new technologies could uh, threaten uh, China's small uh, nuclear forces in one way or another. And it's very difficult uh, to, uh, for the US and China to agree on the, on the extent uh, of, the, of potential threat from such new technologies, given the fact that some of the new technologies are basically invisible, like cyber and AI. And there is no way to agree on, on how much a threat they uh, pose to China's nuclear forces. So that makes the US and China very, uh, it is make very hard for the two sides to agree on uh, how much Chinese nuclear modernization is justifiable uh, and how much is too much. And um, given that uh, there is, uh, there appears to be paranoia uh, among uh, Chinese military experts against the U.S. Uh, advanced military technologies um, and the overall lack of trust between the two sides. China is likely to uh, overestimate the impact of these new technologies. Uh, one example is the U.S. deployment of SAD missile defense system in South Korea in 2016. Uh, it looks like um, Many Chinese experts were genuinely concerned about the radar of this uh, single missile defense uh, system on um, uh, the uh, overall uh, credibility of Chinese nuclear deterrent. Um, so overestimation of, of technological impact is, is a real challenge to bilateral nuclear stability. And um, Another driver is increasingly available funding and resources as China's economy continues to grow very quickly, especially in, in the past few uh, years, uh, past, you know, the last couple of decades. Um, you know, some of the uh, new development we saw recently uh, can be traced back uh, to a long time ago. Uh, you know, the hypersonic uh, Glider program might uh, have started its testing since at least 2014. The DF-20, the DF-41 missile, for example, is uh, you know has been uh, under development for decades. Uh, the Chinese SSBM program is also uh, growing basically incrementally. Um, uh, and with China now. Uh, working simultaneously on all three legs of its nuclear triad. That means there, there are more stakeholders uh, in the nuclear business, uh, the rocket force, the air force, the Navy, they all have um, a piece of the nuclear cake, which means there are, there are more uh, internal supporters for nuclear investment. But on the other hand, there is no uh, internal checks and balances in the Chinese system. Uh, the military and the defense industry were uh, uh, portrayed as, you know, the most uh, patriotic um, uh, institutions. Uh, so what, what they do is purely for advancing the most important Chinese interests. There is no civil organization. There is no expert com community. Uh, there is no media that uh, holds them accountable. So no checks and balances to push back against nuclear advocacy groups. Therefore, um, there's a risk that even if Chinese nuclear uh, buildup is purely driven by a self-defensive objective, uh, they could, uh, uh, you know, over, you know, their uh, development of 
uh, counter missile defense and other measures can easily uh, overkill and they develop uh, too much. Um, for example, all the new uh, Chinese uh, nuclear systems, the Mervin capability, the SSBNs, the new uh, bombers, air launched systems, the silo based uh, ICBMs, uh, hypersonic uh, weapons can be justified uh, by their capability to counter U.S. missile defense in one way or another. Uh, there is really no uh, internal discussion at the unclassified level about how much um, counter missile defense capability China should develop uh, to be enough. Uh, how much is enough? That basic question is not really asked. So, uh, so it's easy to overkill. Uh, so the most simple explanation of China's nuclear buildup uh, is that China wants to develop an assured second strike capability. For decades, uh, China's second strike capability uh, was believed to be uncertain. Right? Another uh, Chinese expert, uh, Professor Wu Ruqiang at Renmin University, who I think gave a talk at this platform before, uh, believed that uh, China uh, was relying on uncertain retaliation. Uh, for its deterrent, which was enough for China before, but now, uh, given changing geopolitical environment, China may believe uh, it needs to further assure its second strike capability. Uh, but again, uh, because of the lack of internal checks and balances, even that uh, self-defensive objective could lead to the development of excessive uh, countermeasures uh, and capabilities. But uh, my personal view is uh, those technical level concerns, such as uh, concerns about U.S. missile defense, uh, are less important uh, than the political level uh, factor that may be driving China's nuclear buildup. Um, we see that uh, the nuclear buildup was uh, relevantly uh, uh, was uh, was. Uh, more or less accel accelerated in recent years, especially in, in 2021, as uh, Brad mentioned in his introduction, uh, Chinese paramount leader uh, made a public uh, statement, uh, basically telling the, uh, the PLA to accelerate the construction of high-level uh, strategic deterrent systems. That's an unprecedented signal from the Chinese most senior uh, leader about uh, its will, about his will to uh, to strengthen uh, the nuclear uh, capabilities in a very uh, dramatic manner, uh, which means there will be uh, more development uh, to be revealed uh, in in the near term future. So why there is this uh, apparent acceleration of nuclear modernization? Uh, after decades of modest and incremental efforts to modernize its nuclear forces. I think that has a lot to do with the uh, uh, new Chinese uh, threat perception, uh, especially in recent years, um, uh, China's overall threat perception uh, towards the United States has uh, significantly uh, increased or heightened. Um, there has been important uh, changes domestically uh, in China since 2008, around the time of the Beijing Olympics. Uh, international analysts have pointed out that since about that time, uh, China started to become more uh, in inward looking, more conservative. Uh, some of the previous efforts to uh, liberalize its economy and political system uh, were gradually uh, walked back. Um, and uh, when the current paramount leader took power in 2012, uh, that trend uh, became accelerated. Um, and uh, as a result, we have seen the US and other Western countries basically uh, became increasingly troubled by their perceived issues with China's uh, practice of human rights, uh, its uh, so-called domestic suppression, its uh, policies in Xinjiang and Hong Kong, uh, its you know, issues with uh, so-called rule of law uh, in China and uh, China's uh, 
uh, compliance with uh, the uh, rules uh, based order, etc. Um, so there is growing uh, American pressure on, on these issues uh, on China. Um, but uh, from the Chinese uh, government perspective, uh, those uh, uh, pressure from the United States were really aimed at destabilizing uh, Chinese uh, political system and Chinese regime. Uh, it indicated that the U.S. government is increasingly unwilling to accept China's uh, unique political system. Um, and the U.S. is increasingly willing to take greater risks to destabilize the system with the eventual goal of, uh, of maybe uh, achieving regime change. So that triggered the most serious concern uh, within China. Uh, the worry, uh, the government worries Chinese regime security is under uh, increasing threat. Uh, and a regime uh, you know, to ensure regime security is always the most uh, important priority of the Chinese government. So that's that's how I think uh, uh, U.S. efforts to basically uphold the, their values and, and principles starts to pose uh, the most serious uh, threat uh, uh, to the Chinese uh, leadership. And that uh, prompts China to uh, comprehensively uh, increase uh, or accelerate its military modernization, including uh, the modernization of its nuclear forces, um, to, to achieve a few goals. The first, I think, is again to reassure Second Strike because of the perceived American willingness to take greater risks to destabilize the Chinese uh, system to threaten Chinese regime. Uh, there is this growing, I think, uh, agreement that uh, greater nuclear force would uh, force the US to accept mutual nuclear vulnerability with China, would force the United States to accept peaceful coexistence with China under its current political system. Um, uh, a, a further assured second strike capability uh, would have increasing uh, political value to uh, counter the perceived American political uh, aggression against China. It will make China, it will make Western countries uh, treat with China with more respect. There is this argument that uh, despite uh, Russians uh, uh, behavior uh, in many places, Western countries uh, are treating Russia with a lot of respect, and that was be that is because of Russia's much greater nuclear arsenal. So uh, a greater Chinese arsenal would also uh, make Western countries uh, treat China with uh, more respect, uh, maybe uh, to uh, drop their uh, criticism on China's human rights, uh, stop pressuring China on, on those uh, issues. Uh, that could undermine its political regime. Uh, but of course, the challenge is if a bigger nuclear arsenal uh, does not deliver the expected uh, impact of giving China more uh, respect uh, from the Western countries, then uh, you know, there may be uh, interest in pursuing even, uh, a, even a, a, a greater still uh, nuclear arsenal. The second possible goal uh, is to uh, develop an escalation control capability. Uh, we know that uh, at least since the 1980s, uh, Chinese military uh, strategists were already uh, thinking about uh, uh, more sophisticated uh, nuclear scenarios in addition to a massive retaliation. Uh, a basic second strike capability would make China secure only in the scenario of a massive retaliation so that China would have to retaliate with uh, most or all of its nuclear forces to whatever type of nuclear attack. Uh, but if the enemy only uh, conducts a small scale of a nuclear attack on peripheral uh, targets, uh, Around, near or within China, uh, especially if the U.S. uses uh, limited regional nuclear attack on China, 
uh, what, how should China respond? Should China go all the way immediately to massive uh, all-out nuclear retaliation? That doesn't really uh, make sense. So uh, I think there is growing interest that China should develop a more diversified nuclear capability in order to be able to respond uh, symmetrically or proportionately uh, to different types of American nuclear attack on China. Uh, and now, uh, given the perception in China that the U.S. is more willing uh, to take greater risks uh, to interfere uh, in Chinese internal affairs, I think this concern about uh, U.S. Uh, uh, conducting a nuclear attack on China uh, is uh, becoming greater. Uh, so there may be a greater sense uh, of urgency uh, for China to develop better escalation control capabilities. At the theater level, China's theater range nuclear forces can already provide China with the capability to respond in kind to uh, a regional uh, U.S. nuclear attack. Um, and uh, maybe China is also working towards de developing capabilities to uh, respond in kind at the intercontinental level. Uh, if the nuclear escalation uh, goes up further uh, from the theater level conflict to a strategic uh, nuclear conflict, and if the U.S. Uh, starts a limited uh, counterforce strike uh, on the Chinese territory, and maybe China wants the capability to also conduct a limited uh, nuclear counter strike against select selected military targets uh, on the U.S. homeland. And that requires uh, Chinese capability uh, to uh, penetrate U.S. missile defense uh, and the increasing accuracy of Chinese missiles uh, uh, is making uh, China more and more capable of doing so. Of course, the challenge is this will raise a greater risk of uh, arms race because uh, if both U.S. and China are now competing to achieve escalation control capability, uh, that's, I think that type of competition is, is, uh, of, is more of a zero-sum nature than if both U.S. and China are simply satisfied with uh, a secure basic second strike uh, based on massive retaliation. So competition for escalation control could make it much harder to to, uh, to uh, conduct self-restraint. Uh, and also uh, in the scenario I just mentioned, if China wants to have the capacity to launch an effective but limited uh, counterforce strike on the U.S. homeland for the purpose of uh, uh, controlling escalation, that means uh, you know, the missile defense becomes a much greater challenge. Um, you know, of, you know, it's, it's much easier to intercept a limited uh, a strategic uh, strike with missile defense uh, than to intercept an all-out Chinese nuclear retaliation. So in this case, uh, missile defense poses even uh, a more acute threat to Chinese uh, capacity to deliver nuclear uh, attack on the U.S. homeland. Uh, so for these reasons, uh, I think there is a there uh, you know the effort to pursue escalation control capability would make the risk of nuclear arms race even greater. And the third uh, likely uh, driver is about the Taiwan uh, situation. Uh, there is clearly uh, evidence that the current Chinese paramount leader has the ambition to. Uh, achieve China's national rejuvenation, which uh, means, I think, uh, as most people believe, is that China needs to achieve uh, unification with Taiwan in the foreseeable future. Um, and uh, I think there is this uh, speculation uh, in China that uh, the acceleration of nuclear uh, buildup has something to do with uh, this uh, effort to uh, achieve national unification with Taiwan in the foreseeable future. And in that scenario, uh, a stronger nuclear force uh, would ensure that the U.S. wouldn't be able to escalate or threaten to ask, escalate 
a conventional conflict with China uh, to the nuclear level. And below the nuclear level, I think China is becoming increasingly confident that its uh, conventional military capability uh, will be able to uh, do the job. Um, so nuclear uh, uh, force will provide a cover uh, for conventional level military operations to achieve perceived uh, national territorial interests. Uh, and now I will discuss, uh, I think, the internal uh, environment, uh, internal policy environment uh, in which this nuclear uh, development is taking place. Um, I think um, we have seen uh, in recent years, of course, there is still, uh, there must be a, a, a power commutation uh, in the Chinese uh, political system, but in general, it looks like uh, the national uh, decision-making power is increasingly concentrated under one person. Um, and uh, I have discussed the lack of internal checks and balances in the system, and uh, even the remaining checks and balances are being uh, gradually uh, removed. Uh, there are tighter security rules uh, across the uh, sectors. Uh, experts, Chinese experts in general, uh, do not appear to know what China is doing regarding its nuclear modernization, uh, including uh, you know, those nuclear experts, including me. Uh, you know, we, we don't, you know, most of China's uh, civilian nuclear experts um, it looks like uh, they don't know what China is uh, working on uh, in terms of its, its nuclear program. Uh, and I believe the Chinese experts even know less about China's development than uh, their American counterparts. The US experts uh, still have access to uh, you know, uh, open source research tools like satellite uh, imagery but Chinese uh, experts basically have to rely on uh, the U.S. experts' research uh, to understand what China is doing. And there is uh, less and less discussion uh, among the Chinese nuclear experts and arms control experts about what China is working on uh, because of the increasing uh, uh, sensitive uh, political environment uh, government has been rolling, rolling out massive campaigns to, uh, to uh, uh, crack down uh, sus suspected espionage and other uh, divulgence of, of secret uh, information. So any discussion, uh, you know, even among colleagues um, on those issues not reported by the Chinese government are viewed as potentially sensitive. So that deters experts to even discuss what is happening. You know, after the revelation of the new silos, the Chinese testing of uh, orbital hypersonic system, among the uh, CV experts, there is basically no discussion. There is no uh, uh, communication about, uh, you know, what, how accurate uh, those foreign reports are, et cetera. So, uh, the, discussion over basic issues is very little. Uh, there is certainly no debate uh, about uh, whether uh, what China is doing makes sense for Chinese uh, security, uh, whether China should uh, continue uh, building up its nuclear forces, etc. Uh, the experts are not playing the role of debating policy and, uh, and uh, providing helpful uh, feedback. Uh, to the official level. And um, under uh, the, the, the new political system, uh, decision-making power is increasingly viewed as uh, something that uh, the Chinese paramount leader possesses. Uh, the experts uh, are supposed to explain uh, and promote and implement the decision of the paramount leader. Uh, their role is uh, increasingly not to uh, uh, provide uh, 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 advice uh, on these uh, sensitive issues. Uh, 
Um, and the Chinese nuclear labs, the, uh, for example, the Chinese Academy of Engineering Physics, which is responsible for the building and the maintaining of Chinese nuclear weapons, people there used to be more pro-arms control and self-restraint uh, in previous decades. But now I think their voice uh, is becoming less important within the system. And by the way, I think they may be uh, also pleased with all the uh, increasing funding and resources uh, under comprehensive modernization program. Uh, so uh, they are not making voices to uh, oppose uh, the, the new development. Um, and the military appears to be more influential uh, internally. Um, but the military is of a stronger competition mindset. Um, but regardless of the civilian or military experts, uh, I think people in general understand that their interest would be better served uh, to promote the leadership's vision. And now the top leadership apparently uh, is supportive of uh, greater nuclear development so there is even less uh, pushback from the experts community, from the bureaucracy. Uh, little question is asked, asked and uh, little checks and balances are ap applied. Um, so uh, it looks like the overall uh, nuclear decision making uh, may be uh, increasingly entering auto piloting. Um, people tend to believe that China is such a good long-term strategic thinker. Uh, but I think uh, when the national power is concentrated under one person, uh, the likely outcome is that the decision-making uh, system will become more messy and ambiguous. So I'm now convinced that all the Chinese nuclear development are happening under a clear long-term strategic uh, guidance. Um, and on top of that, we know that there is uh, increasing information barrier between uh, Chinese society and uh, the rest of the world. Uh, the overall national mindset uh, becomes more, uh, 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 you know, it becomes uh, less diversified uh, the media, the experts community, uh, the government, they are all promoting basically one, uh, one uh, voice, which is the U.S. is inherently uh, hegemonic. Uh, the U.S. is the biggest troublemaker in the world. That's uh, reportedly the words of the Chinese paramount leader. Uh, and uh, the belief is very strong that uh, China is inherently uh, peaceful and uh, pacifist. Um, so under this uh, mindset, uh, I think uh, we are likely to see three things happening. One is uh, at the elite level, at the level of policy elite, uh, there, the risk of uh, a groupthink uh, is growing. Um, and among the public, the general public, uh, there is also this echo chamber that uh, China is under greater uh, strategic threat from the United States and Western countries, and China needs stronger military power to defend its legitimate national interests and nuclear weapons can play an important role uh, in this regard. And in the experts community, uh, I think there is also a trend of Chinese nuclear experts community increasingly uh, decouple from the Western nuclear expert community. As I said, uh, uh, Western experts, they may be able to debate what is happening about Chinese nuclear forces uh, in a timely manner on Twitter and other platforms and share information in the public domain. But the Chinese experts, they cannot access Twitter unless they make uh, some uh, you know, a special effort. Uh, but the majority of Chinese experts, including nuclear experts, security policy experts, they don't access, they don't have access to those platforms so they are less informed about how uh, their Western uh, colleagues are uh, talking about China, how Western nuclear policies are developing and, and the internal debate about nuclear policies, missile defense policies in Western countries. 
So there's a risk of uh, a gradual decoupling uh, between the two experts' communities. During the Cold War, the epistemic uh, community played a role in promoting arms control between the two blocks, but there is a growing risk that the uh, pre-existing epistemic community is now eroding, um, and they may not be able to play that role uh, in the future. So very quickly, I will uh, discuss a few uh, uh, issues about uh, the prospect of using arms control to uh, contain the growing nuclear risk. Uh, first, uh, because of the uh, the the, uh, the uh, mindset uh, in the Chinese system, uh, there is, I think, very little interest in arms control. Uh, in fact, the over Overall thinking appears to be that it's time for China to build up its, nu its nuclear and military forces uh, rather than to uh, constrain itself. And uh, China uh, appears to believe that capability asymmetry uh, between US and China is a major obstacle for China to join arms control. But at the technical level, I think uh, this issue of capability asymmetry can be overcome. Uh, there are already some proposals from the uh, think tank community in, in the Western think tank community about how to combine different types of weapon systems uh, to make China an equal partner in a future potential arms control agreement. So there are technical level solutions to address uh, this issue, uh, but there is uh, there does not appear a lot of political interest in pursuing these uh, solutions. Um, there is certainly the lack of capacity on the Chinese side. Uh, many Chinese experts, uh, they are not very familiar with uh, uh, arms control uh, models, uh, especially the technical details such as how verification and inspection works. And therefore you often hear this argument that verification does not work for China. China is still a weaker nuclear power Therefore, the stronger party, the United States, would be much easier to cheat without being uh, detected in the arms control treaty with China. Uh, it's, it's impossible for verification to uh, work without uh, posing uh, too much risk uh, to Chinese uh, legitimate national secrets. Uh, so it requires a long-term effort to build capacity to uh, help Chinese experts in general understand that verification can work and, and arms control models can work and, and they did work in the Cold War between US and Soviet Union to overcome their political distrust. Uh, so it is possible to design an arms control model that uh, suits Chinese interests, but it takes time to build such capacity. Uh, and China is currently uh, interested in pursuing two things. One is to discuss in crisis uh, management. Um, uh, is, is, this is a hopeful area for near-term dialogue, but uh, uh, China apparently disagrees with the U.S. on what causes crisis instability and who is responsible for causing crisis instability. Uh, and China thinks that uh, that's uh, U.S. aggressive behavior, including its efforts to conduct uh, reconnaissance and surveillance activities near China that is causing uh, risks of accidents. So it, it requires the United States to take the first step to address crisis instability. Uh, so that makes uh, even a discussion on crisis management uh, harder to uh, bear uh, uh, quick fruits uh, in, in the near term future. There is uh, Chinese interest in discussing how new military technologies might affect the nuclear equation and affect uh, big power uh, strategic stability. Uh, so discussing how uh, new technologies may uh, affect nuclear systems may be a hopeful area for near term discussion. And in this area, China is a more uh, equal player uh, it believes it has a greater chance to influence future international uh, norms and rules and institutions. Uh, 
Um, but at the end of the day, what China really wants is some type of strategic reassurance from the United States that the U.S. accepts mutual vulnerability with China at the nuclear level. Uh, the U.S. accepts uh, strategic stability with China at the nuclear level. Uh, and as a specific example of Chinese uh, willing, uh, of American willingness to provide that type of reassurance is American adoption of no first use policy. So those are the most important Chinese demands. Uh, but I think um, I understand you know, how uh, no first use and other issues are problematic for the United States given its domestic debates and politics. But I think the US should not be afraid uh, to uh, talk about uh, to talk with China about these issues because if you look at Chinese uh, thinking, apparently China does not have a clear idea about uh, how it wants to be reassured about specific demands or expectations it wants to get from the United States. It has very little idea about what concrete reassurance signals it, it is looking for from the United States about US accepting mutual vulnerability. Uh, it is uh, unclear how China uh, wants the US to do to make uh, its future no first use uh, uh, policy credible to China. Uh, you know, given the Biden administration's willingness to consider sole purpose or no first use policy, the Chinese response has been a little suspicious which means even if the U.S. adopts no first use uh, in the future, uh, China probably wouldn't trust it. So it still requires uh, a discussion between the two sides about what constitutes credible no first use policy, and that applies to both countries' cases. So there are still a lot of useful discussions that can happen, um, and the U.S. could use those discussions as an opportunity to engage with China and hopefully uh, that discussion can be expanded into a more comprehensive dialogue on potential issues. I've been going on for too long, so I will stop here and look forward to any uh, questions and comments. Thank you. Well, that definitely wasn't too long. Thank you. That was excellent. Highly substantive. Very interesting. Thank you so much.